Okay, hello, hello. Thank you so much everyone for coming. My name is Miranda Metcalf and I'm the director for the Institute for Electronic Arts here at Alfred University. Before we get started, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the Onondogwa people on whose ancestral homelands we gather and the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. The IEA and events such as this are supported by the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation, the New York State Council for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Shine Joseph Endowment, the School of Art and Design, and the Department of Expanded Media at the New York State College of Ceramics. This is our last public event for the 2023 calendar, but we have a lot more programming scheduled for the new year. So please keep an eye on the Arts at Alfred newsletter and our Instagram for more events. This afternoon, I am thrilled and honored to introduce Clarence Hayward. Clarence is a painter, collagist, whose work explores notions of black American experience, primarily focusing on the use of media and historical documentation is used to shape perceptions of black American culture. His work investigates cultural truths, challenges, stereotypes, and examines identity. He has exhibited his work in spaces nationally, including the 21C Museum of Durham, the Harvey B. Gantt Center for Cultural Arts, the Wiregrass Museum, the Museum of Science and Industry Chicago, Art Miami Art Fair, the Dallas Art Fair, Container Santa Fe, the North Carolina Museum of Art, the National Museum of Art at Duke University, and CAN, the Contemporary Art Museum of Raleigh. His work is in several private and public collections of note, including North Carolina Museum of Art, the National Museum of Art, the Ackland Museum of Art, the Cameron Museum of Art, and the Rubel Family Collection. Please join me in welcoming Clarence Hayward. I can't believe she really did that flip. No pressure. All right, this is the uh, beginning of my presentation. I'll allow everyone a couple seconds to get my Instagram. I need followers, I'm serious. But, um, it's Clarence Hayward Art at Instagram. Follow that? Of course. I think. <laughs> All right. So this is definitely not a formal uh, artist talk, just to let you guys know. It's more of a conversation. So if you have any questions or anything while I'm talking, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. I know sometimes people forget what they want to ask by the end of the presentation. All right, where do I start? All right, I'm not going to cry. A lot of times I get emotional when I talk because I don't know how I got here, but I'm here. So, where do I start with this one? I talk to a lot of kids, so I usually start when I'm like really young and tell them how I used to color and color in books and all that, but a lot of us in here are artists, so we kind of get how it starts. Uh, so I'll get right to it, art school. So I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I went to LaGuardia High School, which is a performing arts high school in New York. I kind of excelled in art at a young age. Uh, I moved down to North Carolina to go to North Carolina Central, where I was just an art major for the first two years, and then I changed my major to art education because everyone said artists don't make any money, and I would need a job. Until I was a senior, and I started student teaching, and they told me the salary was going to be $23,000. It was $23,252, I'll always remember. And I decided I would never teach. All right. So after college, I ended up being a truck driver because the salary was almost triple that of a teacher at the time. And I did that for 10 years. And I got 
to be, and I'm telling everybody my age, 35. And when I hit 35, I kind of like hit a wall in my life, thinking, what am I doing? And why am I a truck driver? How did I end up in North Carolina? Like, it was a lot of dark nights. So I told my wife, who I knew since high school, you know, what I was thinking about. And her first response was, you're not happy because you're not an artist. And I don't know how long she was sitting on that or where it came from, but I was just like, what are you talking about? Because I hadn't picked up a pen, pencil, paintbrush in like 10 years. So when she told me that, the way my mind works is I had an excuse. I had an out. So I'm like, all right. If I stop driving trucks and become an artist, if it doesn't work, it's not my fault, right? Like she told me to do this. I, that's how I was thinking. But before I quit, I came home from work one night and we had extra bedrooms that we didn't use. And she had turned with this bedroom into like an artist studio, which was cool. But at the time, I didn't paint. And there was canvases everywhere and like paints, which is kind of how I started with acrylic because. I was primarily like charcoal and really charcoal. I didn't like painting it when I was in college. But I started coming home at night or on the weekends and started just painting celebrities and drawing celebrities and just, it gave me like, it was almost like therapy at the time. It just gave me something to do and I was like not sad anymore, I guess. And then after like a year of doing that, she was just like, okay, I think you're really ready to quit your job. And I was just like, yo, I didn't save any money this last year. I know we talked about it, but she was like, don't worry about it, just go ahead and quit. So I did it. And I didn't know how to be an artist. Like I had talent, but I didn't know what to do with it. So luckily we live in the age of the internet and I went to YouTube and I watched probably every video on YouTube on like how to be an artist. And I found out about residencies. When I was in college, they didn't talk about residencies. I didn't even know what a residency was. So I started applying for residencies because I had a portfolio of like celebrities like Muhammad Ali and all these people I was just drawing because I didn't really have a voice. I just knew I had talent. So I was just going on Instagram, find a picture, draw it. So I didn't have an artist statement, I didn't have anything. All I had was like 20 drawings maybe and like a couple bad paintings. And I applied for this residency in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'll never forget. And I thought I didn't get it because I didn't hear back for a long time, but I filled out my paperwork wrong and had like the wrong email address. It, I had like an AOL email address, which I hadn't used since, once again, telling my age. <laughs> and um, one Sunday night, the director of the program called and said, hey Clarence, I've been trying to get in contact with you for like the last three weeks. Uh, do you want this residency or not? She wasn't even nice about it. She kind of was like, do you want it or not? And I was just like, yes, I want it. Because you got a free studio for a year, and at the end of the year, you got a show. So I got the residency, and it was the first time I had a studio like outside of my home ever, besides like college. And I treated it like a job, because at this point, I didn't have one. Actually, I take that back. I was broke for a while, so I started Ubering at night. So I would go to um, the studio at 8 o'clock and stay till 5, and then I would Uber at night. And I did that for like six months. But the reason I stopped Uber was when I got the residency, I started applying to every show. Like I was paying to get in shows. I was doing a bunch of stuff. And I had a show in Raleigh somewhere at a gallery. And I was Ubering. So I went to the show, went to the opening. And, you know, it was pretty successful or whatever. I had a good time. And when I left the show, it's time to go to work. So I clocked into Uber. And it was probably like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And the guy gets in my car and he's like, man, I know you. And it was weird because on the news around this time, all the Uber drivers were getting like robbed. So I was just like, this might be my time, right? <laughs> but he was like, no, I really know you. And I was like, man, you don't know me. And in Brooklyn, when people tell you they know you, you they set you up to rob you. So I'm like, oh man, like, here we go. And he's like, you're the art guy. And I was like, oh man, like, I'm not getting robbed, but now it's just like, I can't be out here driving Uber and be the art guy. <laughs> so that was like my last Uber ride. And then I just really like focused and kept putting out art. And then, I don't know, I'm trying to re recount the story. 
Okay, so after that happened, I had my six month review with the uh, residency. And she came to the studio and she's like, all right, so what's your exhibition gonna be about? And once again, this is like me trying to find my voice. I'm like, I don't know. But the first thing I said to her was, um, my exhibition is gonna have chicken and watermelon. Cause I was trying to break the ice. She was like a white woman. I was like, okay, I'm a cracker joke. And like that didn't go over well. She was just like, that's racist. I mean, I think I have a, a painting in here that I actually ended up doing to get, but I'll tell you about that when I get there. Um, but she was like serious. She was like, no, like this is not gonna cut it. I'm like, look at all the work I'm making. She was like, no, well, like what's your exhibition gonna be about? What, why are you making what you're making? And I'm just like, cause I got a free studio. Like, so I'm about to start, start showing you the images of stuff I was making. I kept a couple, the first two are like ugly images. Most artists don't show their ugly images, but I mean, I had to throw it somewhere, so I'll show you. Um, so these first two are like, things I made while I was at the residency and then it gets into like the exhibition when I finally buckled down and kind of found my voice and I did that really by holding up a mirror to myself and exploring like who I was and why I was here basically okay everybody got the Instagram down all right cool I'm gonna start the slides so this is like one of the first paintings I made during that residency don't judge me but I found like an image on Instagram and just painted it. And I have like an affinity for graphic design. So a lot of my work has like text and like different colors and patterns and stuff in it. Um, funny enough, this painting didn't sell until like a year ago because I didn't show it. But this is like one of the first ones. I don't even know why I made it, but is there. Um, this is a painting that I'm not a fan of anymore, but it was the first painting that got me any recognition in the museum in Raleigh. Um, they had an open call, I applied and it got in and I didn't win any awards for it, but somebody bought it and like it was in a couple magazines and everybody loved it. But now I look at it and like, man, I made that. But so you also see in a lot of my work, um, it's of my family, of my kids, of me, my wife, my two daughters. So during COVID, I kind of lost the energy to paint and I started dabbling in collage and it opened up like a new avenue for me because at the time no one was coming to the studio, no one could come to the studio and I, I, I am a little business savvy, so I did this thing where um, every Friday at 10 a.m. I would release a collage. And every Friday at like 10.05, I sold the collage. It was like the weirdest thing ever, but it also the collages were like $500. So every week I got $500 for releasing the collage. And a lot of them were like simple like this until I found a, a stash of magazines where I can get for really cheap and then they got more developed. But at the time I was working with what I had. Um, so this is a collage that was in one of that first exhibition I had during that residency. Um, I started telling stories with these collages. So this one is called There's No Place Like Home. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on here, but it says 1620. That's uh, Plymouth Rock. My brain started going to like Alice in Wonderland and how the house fell on uh, the Wicked Witch. And these are two little, man, this is college, what can I say? Hmm? So these represent like two enslaved people and Plymouth Rock like fell on them. So it's like a play on Malcolm X when he said, you know, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us because it fell out of the sky. And it's called There's No Place Like Home because it's in reference to like Alice in Wonderland and then the longing for home. Uh, this one was called a Recipe for Disaster because anytime you have a conversation about any of these topics, the conversation always goes left. Uh, so I made this during like the height of like the protest after George Floyd when they were burning the city down and everyone in my hometown was going in. So I made this collage called Burn Baby Burn. 
because at the time I felt like it needed to be burnt down. But I won't go there. Um, so this painting is in reference to a couple people. So this is Idris Sandu, who is a tech genius. He uh, worked with Nipsey Hussle to design the Marathon clothing store. And I talked to him on Instagram a couple times and decided to make a painting of him. And he's known for coding, which is why the code is embedded in there. But this is also when I was exploring Gold Leaf in my studio. I started studying Barclay Hendricks really, really heavy, who's my favorite artist. And he used a lot of Gold Leaf, so I started playing with it. And this was like the first official painting I did with Gold Leaf. Um, this painting kind of changed my life. So this was like the first painting I sold of significance. Actually the second, but... So I had this in an exhibition um, in Raleigh. It's a portrait of my friend who's also an artist. His name is uh, William Paul Thomas. So this is the first time I actually spent a lot of money to buy a lot of gold leaf and make a painting. And it was like 40 by 60, so it was kind of big. This is that first exhibition where I had to make a full body of work at the end of my residency. Uh, I titled it Descendants of Sire uh, because I was thinking about where I came from and you know how did I get to be who I was. And if you notice, there is a painting of chicken and watermelon. It's called Food for Thought. I made that specifically for the gallery director because after I had the conversation with her, I called my mom to find out why chicken and watermelon was considered racist because I heard of it, but I never really knew why. And she didn't know. She told me to call my grandmother. I called my grandmother and she said, boy, you always call me with these questions. <laughs> like, so I figured she didn't really know. So I looked it up and when I looked it up, I mean, I don't wanna give a history lesson, but the idea of the chicken and watermelon isn't racist. The propaganda around chicken and watermelon is what's really racist. And the propaganda started because after enslavement, the um, watermelon was like, everyone ate watermelon at the time and it was almost like a way of economic freedom for black Americans at the time. And the way things worked is they were making too much money, so they came out with posters and propaganda about it. But anyway, I made the painting and I don't know if there's a close up, but I'm, I actually have a portrait of myself inside of the chicken. This is also one of the paintings, it's called Tug of War. Um, at the time I was struggling with my identity. I went to TJ Maxx and I bought this like the shiki that was made in China that was like a size too small and I was struggling with the fact that, that I bought it and it was like why did I buy it? So I made a painting to talk about it. And everyone, like when we talk about the painting, they think it's something else, but it's really just me struggling with my identity because like I'm African American, but I've never been to Africa, but I find my culture in TJ Maxx and I'm drawn to it and it's like, but this is not real. So, I mean, it was a whole struggle kind of thing. Um, this is another painting I did with Gold Leaf, but this is, I embossed the Pledge of Leaves just behind myself. It's called PTSD. Um, so once again, with this exhibition, I was thinking about my history, my childhood growing up, like things that were kind of indoctrinated into me. And I thought about how every day I had to get up and say the Pledge of Allegiance, but when I went outside, I don't know if it necessarily applied to me. Um, this is the first painting that I sold to a museum. So I went to the Nasher at Duke University. And I don't think it's on display right now, but it was. They took it down, but it'll be back up. There's the food for thought. So I don't know if you noticed, but I'm inside the chicken, but it's hard to see it from afar, but when you walk up on it, like I'm looking directly at you. And then I use copper leaf for the letters so they shine. I wanted it to look like a magazine cover because it's kind of like referencing the propaganda. Um, this is Antonymous, I actually made this painting by accident. I was just playing around in the studio with different like textures and stencils and like there's vinyl in there. Um, so it's a bunch of flags and groups that I belong to but they don't seem to fit together in a puzzle. 
And when I looked the word up, antonymous is a word, so that's how I came up with it. This is the first painting that I ever made in green. So if you ever look me up on the internet, you probably won't see a painting with natural skin color. It's all green. Um, can I talk about George Floyd yet? Okay. So uh, after we all witnessed the murder of George Floyd on TV, I struggled with that for a while, and I started thinking about how like the media shapes the perception of blackness, and I also started thinking about well, having conversations with people at the studio. You know, there were so many different opinions on it, and it was just like none of us know like George or what it really happened. We just see what happened on TV, and who knows? You know, some people are like it's not real, and it was just like, well, you can't really believe everything you see. So I decided, once again, I went to Instagram. I wasn't fully off of Instagram references yet, but I went to Instagram and grabbed a photo of a guy and I painted him green to kind of reference like green screen and the media and how we look at black people through the lens of the media. And it's also at this time I stumbled upon variegated gold leaf, which I'm telling another one of my secrets, but Barkley Hendricks used it a lot in his later work. So I ordered some and started playing with it and a lot of my work is flat, so this is a way I get some texture and dimension to it. But yeah, this was the first green person. This is a blurry painting, but this is the second one, and it's also the first painting in the exhibition that I had at the Contemporary Art Museum of, of Raleigh. So they actually gave me a show, right? But, so this was the first museum that reached out to give me a solo exhibition. And they told me I could do whatever I want. And at the time, I still was dealing with, like, thinking about George Floyd. And there was still, like, a lot of, like, turmoil in the streets of Raleigh. And the only thing I kept thinking about was, like, I have two kids and a wife. What happens if this happens to me? So I built a whole show around it. And the museum didn't see it until, like, a week before it went in because they said I can make whatever I want. So, <laughs> so there was a lot of discussion around that, but... This was the first painting called Invisible Man. So I just painted myself in the position that, you know, I last saw George Floyd in. And I painted myself green on green because when you use the chroma key technology, if you put, if it's a green screen and you put green in front of it, it's basically invisible. Um, so these are just some more paintings from the exhibition. I did a small series, of, a small family portrait of me, my wife, and my children. Individually, I also did one huge one. This is just me in the studio working on some of the paintings. So this is kind of the setup and what it looked like. This is a painting from the exhibition. It's a portrait of my wife. I titled it While You're Away. Um, I thought this is what she would look like or this is what she would have to become if you know I was murdered. So these are my two kids at the time. I think they were nine and like nine and five when I painted this. It's called Candyland. Um, I got the title because they played Candyland a lot at the house. And I went to Google and I saw that there's no way to really win Candyland. You just play forever. And I started thinking about it. Like if I wasn't here to like help guide them, like they might be playing the game with no intention, right? So it was like if you remove structure, which is what I kind of provide, they would basically be playing a real life game of Candyland. So I came up with this composition. Um, this is the second painting that I was, the museum purchased. So this is in the collection of the North Carolina Museum of Art. Uh, it's a portrait of my daughter holding the Lauryn Hill album. So she's really into music. And then she likes the 90s. So we bought her like a CD player and the first album she wanted was Lauryn Hill. I don't know how she knows about it, but I really thought about um, when I was in high school and this album came out, all the girls changed. Like they matured overnight. And I started thinking about if I wasn't here anymore, what, what I want to leave my, my daughter with. It's like, I can't teach her how to be like a woman, but whatever Lauryn Hill is saying, like it changes people. So I decided to make a portrait of her with the Lauryn Hill album. 
I mean, the books, are, you know, other, there's other symbols in it, but primarily I was focused on the Lauryn Hill. Um, this is a portrait I made of my grandmother. All of this is from that same exhibition. A portrait of my grandmother, who was like super religious. Um, right before I made this painting, we kind of got into an argument because she told me the only reason I had any success is because she prayed for me. And yeah, so that was like a rough one. So in a way, I made this painting as an apology because I had never painted her before. And I probably said some things I shouldn't have said. So I decided to make a painting and include her in it. And it's a portrait of her with the Lord's Prayer behind her holding a prayer plant. And then I'll tell you something I haven't really told a lot of people. So originally, I called her and told her I wanted to paint her. And she wore this dress that looked like it was like a tie-dye dress. And I was like, you know I'm making a painting, right? And she's like, oh, yeah, this is my favorite. So I did it, and I hated it. It was like 50 colors. So I started experimenting with glitter. So I just glittered the whole thing. So now when you walk in the museum, it's just like super bright because they put all the lights on it. So it looks cool now. And this is the painting that the Rubel family bought. They came all the way up, and they picked this painting. And I was trying to show them all the nice ones. <laughs> this one is nice, too. This is recorded. <laughs> but they picked this one. So this is the biggest painting I've ever done. It's uh, 120 by, no, 144 by like 72 or something like something like that. But it's just, uh, my favorite show growing up was Family Matters with Urkel. It's because I looked like Urkel when I was little. I had like the big glasses and everything. And I mean, there's a whole lot of symbolism in this painting that I probably, I'm not gonna talk about, but there's a reason why I made it. So after the exhibition, I started making other paintings. Um, I started referencing like some of my historical, like my art, what do I call them, heroes or whatever. So I made this painting to go, I mean, after I saw uh, um, Barclay Hendricks' exhibition, my painting is a triptych, it's called Red Light, Green Light, but his painting was Sir Charles, AKA Willie Harris. Um, this painting is huge in, per in person, but with my work, I'm referencing the the idea of like invisibility and being visible. And at the time, I was researching like color blindness, and there was like a a red green color blindness, which I found out one of my friends has. But it was weird how I found that out too. But <laughs> so I decided to make a painting talking about like what do you see a threat? Like what do you see when you see me? And that's why I call it red light, green light. It's almost like the game red light, green light, one, two, three. Like, do you stop, do you go? Which is why I made it. But it's referencing this guy who was actually like a criminal, like on college campuses. But get Barkley Hendricks' book, he talks all about it. So this is a series, an ongoing series that I'm, there's three, six, nine, 12, but so far I've done 30 of these portraits. There's gonna be 50. Um, the first one is up in the corner. The series is called In My Hood. So after Trayvon Martin was murdered, Gerardo said that Trayvon wasn't murdered because he was black. He was murdered because he was a black man wearing a hoodie, and black men shouldn't wear hoodies because they're threatening. So I made the first painting in response to that, and then I felt like it wasn't enough. So I just started finding, like, all the black guys that I knew who come from different walks of life and painting portraits of them. And the goal is to have 50, not to fill up a gallery space with them. So when you walk in, like, now you have to stare at 50 black men who aren't really threatening, but, like, I have friends on here who are doctors, and my nephew, like, an accountant. Like, there's so many different people on there. Like, you don't, you can't look at somebody and, and say, oh, and they're a threat. I mean, the first one, I look a little threatening, but I don't in that one. So this is a series that um, I take to Miami every year now. It's called Swimming Lessons. Uh, I'll give you a short story behind that. So like two years ago, me and my family uh, stayed at a really nice hotel in New Orleans. And on the way to the pool, my wife was said everyone was going to leave when we got there. I should tell you the hotel. But full disclosure, we go the week before Essence Fest. So it's before all the like, rich black people get there. So. We're kind of like the only black people in the hotel at the time. So, and she kind of, she's good at reading like the energy in, in spaces. So when she said that, I was just like, yeah, whatever. Like we paid a lot of money to be going to the pool. 
We take the kids to the pool. There's like five families who don't look like us. So I get on my phone, I'm, you know, Instagram or whatever. I look up, everybody's gone. It's just the kids in the pool. So now I have to, you know, tell my wife that she's right. But then we also have, I'm like, I have to explain situations like this to my kids. And I'm like, well, there are things that I have to explain to my kids that other people don't because they're black. So I came up with this idea called swimming lessons to use the vehicle of swimming just because this is where the event happened to explain, you know, some life lessons to them. Ironically, I can't swim. So I, it's a lot of me like looking up swimming rules and turning them into lessons and, you know, talking, having discussions about it and then making paintings. So these were like the first two. They're called swimming lessons one and two, right? Because they were the first two. But it's my wife. Uh, the black and white actually represents the hotel that we stayed at because everything there is black and white. When you go to the pool, the cabanas, everything is black and white. So if you go to New Orleans and you see black and white, you know what I'm talking about. Get out of there now. <laughs> so this is exactly what we had on that day, too. So I just went and took reference photos on what we had on. Um, this is the portrait of my youngest daughter, Lauren, who is like, she's probably the closest thing to me because she's like, she takes no junk. Um, I made this painting called Dive because all around the pool there were signs that said no diving, which I made portraits of my children that said no diving too. But I made this of her saying dive, basically telling her to take risk, basically, right? Like dive in, even if it says no diving, don't worry about it. Like live with the consequences, like live life on your own terms, which is a lesson that I teach my kids. That's me, believe it or not, when I was 10. I made a couple of pieces about this, too. Um, this is just introducing another body of work that I uh, did called About a Dream, which came from these helmets. So one of my studio mates came in one day with this helmet, and it reminded me of Evil Knievel. I don't know if you guys know who Evil Knievel is, but he's a daredevil. And that the helmet lived in my studio for like a couple months and I had no reason to take it home because I wasn't gonna have my kids put this helmet on that came from the back of a van. But then the more I looked at it, the more I thought about like daredevils. And then uh, I started thinking about my kids, how I want them to be daredevils and take risks and not be afraid. And then I started thinking about my life, how I really just quit my job and jumped out the window and I was a daredevil. So I made this whole body of work called uh, Dare, Dare to Dream. It was about a dream, because the show was about my original dream. But I made a series of paintings, Dare to Dream. So there's like five or six kids that I painted, like my friend's kids. And everybody has this helmet on, which is like basically your armor and following your dream. So these are like some collages and things I made about following my dream. Uh, this is the first studio I had, which was like a shoebox, but this is just me working in it. It was like a photo shoot, so I saved it and I reused it. Oh, that's not the last. Man, originally I planned on showing you my website, so I guess I didn't put enough slides in here. But um, I wanted to show some of the ugly paintings too, so I had to make the slideshow. But yeah, that's pretty much where I am now. Making work, uh, I have a couple bodies of work that came after this, but basically the last five years of my life, I've been an artist. Uh, I haven't been able to say that for a long time. I used to be afraid to say it out loud because I thought it was fake, but yeah, that's me. Thank you.